backdrop on the book of Titus. Um, Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, uh, names himself as the author. This book would have been written probably mid-60s A.D., um, about 30 or so, maybe 35 years after Jesus rose from the grave, this would have been written. Um, it was written to a man named Titus who Paul had put in leadership over a church or the church on the island of Crete. Uh, it was a bit of a rough place. <clears throat> um, we'll read about kind of how the people there were, what they lived like a little bit. But... Um, what Paul is doing is he's pouring his heart out as a leader, telling Titus what is important in this church surviving and attaching itself to Jesus and what it really means to be a believer and live that way. Okay, So let's go ahead and break into Titus chapter 1. <clears throat> you can follow me along there. Feel free to write on that. That's yours to take home. Um, I want to give you an example, too, of you have permission as a believer to slow down with your coffee and read it slow and really look at what it's saying. The introduction is loaded. We could have the whole day just on the introduction. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. That's not even the end of the sentence. There's a semicolon. Paul is like long sentenced. Okay? Let's just stop for a minute and look at what Paul is saying about himself. Now, Paul's an early leader of the church. He calls himself an apostle. Justin and I were having a coffee last night. He says, what's an apostle? So I'm going to give you a bit of it. The Bible talks about five-fold gifts given to the church. There's apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. What are those? I describe an apostle as a person who is a leader, and they're a strong leader, and they're kind of an unapologetic, here's the truth leader. Okay? They're not cold. They're just, they're not concerned about the feeling so much of how you take it. They're just putting the truth out there because they don't have time to mess around, okay? Okay? They're out here, they're going to put the truth out there, and they're going to lead, and they're often leading a lot of people, okay? That's the call of an apostle. A prophet is a speaker of truth. Sometimes God will show them things that are going to happen. Sometimes they will just speak the truth into a place. Again, without apology, but their heart tends to be much softer for the people that they're calling out to. Many of the prophets in the Old Testament called out to the nation of Israel to turn your hearts, repent, turn back to what God has said, turn from your wicked ways that he would have mercy on you. He wants to have mercy on you. <clears throat> That's a prophet. An evangelist? Jim's an evangelist. Here's an evangelist. They want to throw the gospel out there. They want to spread the seed of the gospel out there, and all they want is people to tell it to. Okay? Randy used to say this way, evangelist and pastor... You catch them, I'll clean them. The evangelist is out there fishing. He doesn't care who eats the fish. He doesn't care who takes it home. He just wants the fish. And the more fish he catches, the happier he is. He wants to put the word of God in, out in front of the faces of hungry people. He's not going to disciple them. He'll love them. He'll care about them. But he's not the person who's going to disciple them, care for them, and shepherd them, and, and be there for them, and teach them. He just wants to get a hold of them and pull them in the door, right? Amen, Jim? The pastor is the shepherd. He's the one that's going to spend some one-on-one -on -one time. He's going to shepherd them and care for them and bind up their wounds and care about where their heart's at and their thought process and talk through the baggage and help them understand who Jesus is. And a teacher, you just break it down a little more. They're going to find and understand the details you're tripping on and help you clarify them and teach you how to read the word right and this is what life is really about and what do you think about you know god being in control of everything what's that make you think about oh you're battling with this and this seems kind of unfair let's talk and they just will break it down and help make sense so you see how it goes from big to small right paul is called as an apostle he's writing letters to entire churches and this letter is not just to titus it's to the leadership that's now spreading the word of God on an entire island called Crete. 
Okay? <clears throat> Here's what he says about himself. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. Why, is God, why has God called Paul? Has God called Paul, according to what Paul's saying, has God called him so that he can put, hey, you get the apostle patch on your arm. You get to speak at conferences and make big money and write a lot of books. That is not the reason God has called Paul. Paul says, an apostle of Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. Do you know why God has called me to be the pastor of this church? Because I'm a really, really super good guy. That's why. Because when I was growing up, I didn't do any drugs. That's why he called me. That's not why. He called me here for your sake, not for mine. Is there blessing in the job I do? Yep. He didn't call me here for me. He called me here for your sake, that you would know what the truth of the word of God is and that you would rightly divide that and know who he is. And guess what? Part of my job is to find the next leader in the group and encourage them to grab onto what God's called them to. They may be the leader of their house. They may be the leader of a Bible study. They may be the next pastor of this church. I wasn't the pastor of this church eight years ago. I was a guy who helped out. I played guitar and worship. I did some Sunday school stuff. I led some Bible studies. But then God moved and he changed some things. This church grows. It's going to need more than one pastor, more than one leader. You might be the guy. You might be the person who leads. I can't lead everybody. God's calling me to lead leaders more and more. And that might be you. And that's not something to be afraid of. Because again, he wouldn't call you for your sake. He'd call you for the sake of the people that he's called you to minister to. It's not about you. It's not about you. Which accords with godliness. <laughs> one, little, one more phrase. Paul's saying, God called me as an apostle for the sake of your faith and for the sake of your knowledge, which accords with godliness. What does that mean? He's saying, God called me to preach the truth to you and to build your knowledge, and your lives will reflect that. That's what he's saying, which accords with godliness. If you're learning the truth, your life will be changing. If you believe that the Spirit of God and the Word of God can be present in a life and make no difference, then you believe that the Spirit of God and His Word could exist in a life and not make any difference. That's crazy. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Paul's saying, I've been called, I've been commanded by God to preach the truth of the gospel to you, and that's why I'm an apostle. Not because of my qualifications, not because I'm good. Paul even says, I didn't come to you with eloquent words, but in weakness, so that God's strength could be manifest through me. Paul was very likely a short guy, probably not super good looking, might have been bald. He just wasn't a guy who's, wow, that guy is like, he looks like a leader. We should follow him. That is not, according to the Bible, the type of guy Paul was. And you know what? In some of Paul's writings, I take Paul as this guy who showed up at a church that he had planted, and there were some people who were like, oh, the loudmouth is here again. <clears throat> I think Paul could be a jerk. I really think he could. He parted ways with other ministers at one time because he just couldn't get along with them. He literally said of one guy, you take him. He's not worth anything to me. Does that sound like the kind of pastor you want? But this guy was used by God to write the better part of the New Testament. God doesn't pick perfect people. He picks people. And people have issues. And people have baggage. And people have problems. And we're all human beings. But he uses people. Okay, I'm going to read from here to the end of the chapter. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to just, just concentrate on first chapter of Titus today. This is why I left you in Crete. Now he's talking to Titus, the, the person he's addressing in the letter. This is why I left you in Crete, 
so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, which means set apart, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. At that time, there were a group of Jews who had kind of embraced Jesus, but they were trying to drive home all the laws and rules and regulations and say, yeah, you need to believe in Jesus, but you got to keep all these rules too, and if you don't, God won't love you. Okay? They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what, ought, what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. You want that guy for a pastor? <laughs> this is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Where is he going with this? <clears throat> when I'm talking to people and I'm talking about faith, I want you to understand one thing. We are human beings, and everybody you will run into who breathes is a human being. I don't care where they grew up, what they're into, how good or bad they seem to be, they are a human being, and there are common threads that run through all of us, in the church, out of the church. We all have a sin nature. Sometimes we see people who grew up out of the church as different than we are. The difference is one thing. When Christ comes into a life, he changes the paradigm. He changes us from selfish to more and more selfless. He changes us from our priorities to realizing that he has a priority. He changes us from interpreting what we think is okay and not okay in this world to looking at his word and saying, he has established right and wrong and my life either lives by it or doesn't. The law cannot be formed by what everybody around me thinks. As a normal human being, you kind of make up what you kind of think is good and bad and some things can slip and some can't. That's not what a Christian looks like. They look to the word for truth and they try to live by it. And the change in them comes from their surrender to the one who they need to rescue them. Out in the world, you do everything you can to build up your strength and to make it through and to find a way. As a believer, you say, I'm going to give it my best, but it'll never be enough. Only he can be enough. And only by grace is his mercy poured out on me. Praise the Lord. I'm excited about what he can do through me because I'm limited. I'm human. It's just a paradigm shift. They just... People who haven't known Christ just haven't found it yet. So if you're out there looking for Jesus where he hasn't come in yet, it's, if it upsets you not to find him, you're just not looking at it straight. Right? You're only going to find him where he is. And where he's not, there's a desperate need for him. Have mercy on that person and hand them the truth. Love them. Come up beside them. Come at them from, I'm a sinner too. And I want to share with you how God has changed my life. This is what he's done in me. Right? I'm saying that to say this. Common thread runs through everything. Why is Paul saying to Titus, set up leaders and make sure that they don't have this and this and this and this and this? Must be above reproach. Not arrogant, quick-tempered, a drunkard, or violent, greedy for gain. They have to be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Must hold firm to the trustworthy word. Why would he say that? 
because there were people in the church there, just like there are people in the church here, who either are the wrong things or aren't the right things. Is that a condemnation? Is that judging? It's called the truth. Nothing in your life will change that you don't identify. AA will tell you that. NA will tell you that. Every uh, motivational speaker in the world will tell you that. I heard a video. I heard a video. I did hear the video, but it was a video, so I watched it also. <clears throat> this week that someone had put up, and uh, the guy was a bit vulgar in how he expressed this truth, but I was like, wow, like the world needs to hear this. Here's what he said. Everything is your fault. Do I think that everything in the world is your fault? No, but here's the point he's making. He said, until you come to the place where you realize that you are the one who determines many things in your life and stop blaming everybody and every situation around you and grab the handlebars and drive this thing, you are going to play the victim the rest of your life and never get anywhere. So it's, it's time for you to just figure out that, guess what? You're on the hook. And I was like, wow. The things I want to change in my life, guess what? I got to want them more than I want to sleep and more than I want other things. Now, that's a secular worldview, but there's some truth buried in that thing, right? You're not going to get anything you don't really want. That's true. Now, where Christ comes into it is when we, we realize that Am I going to find true peace in my own efforts? Here and there, little, but not long-lasting. We've all heard money won't make you happy. And I often say all I'm asking for is one opportunity to prove that that's true. <laughs> that's all I'm looking for, <laughs> right? We know that money can't make you happy. We know that success won't match it. So there's something missing from the human heart that is Jesus. But what happens when we plug him into raw truth that the world needs to hear? What if I said, listen, you're not happy with who you are as a believer. You're not happy with your prayer life, or you're not, you keep having this thing you stumble over. You can't get beyond these couple of things. I said, man, you need to grab onto him and, and run. You need to start saying no to some other things. You got distractions in your life. Let go of them. You know, stop complaining, man. Grab onto him like, like in a way you never have in your life. Pick up the word, read it, and believe it's the truth. Dig for answers. There's something bigger than you out there. You know, I, when I talk to people whose lives are changing, and we start talking, like, look at this common thread, man. It changes everything in your life. But you start discovering new ways of communicating with people. You start discovering new ways of dealing with anger. You start discovering that your perspective is not the only one in the world, and his is like, wow, life-changing. I've seen this wrong my whole life. And things start getting healthy. And you start becoming a better person and a better husband and a more effective parent and a better employee. And things start to change. And that's when the world starts seeing you as salt and light. I don't put salt on my eggs because it looks nice. I put salt on my eggs because it makes it taste better. It adds a flavor to things. If you've been, ever been on a salt-free diet, I'll put you on my prayer list. That is a bad place. Like, everything tastes like bleh, right? <clears throat> salt is a big deal. We've all been walking through the house in the middle of the night and boom, pinky toe on something heavier than your pinky toe can move. And you, you're like, Light is a massively good tool. It's really good, especially when you're driving. Headlights, yeah. We are salt and light in this world. But here's the truth. You can't be salt and light if this isn't alive to the core of you. You can't be. You know, the church today has too many one-lens LEDs in a lunch bag walking through the world. From 20 feet away, I can tell there's a light somewhere, and I don't know what he's supposed to be lighting up, but I can see it. This world needs spotlights. This world needs believers whose lives are so lit that the meter is smoking. J. 
just on fire about things, like God is moving in your life. Does that mean you need to look like Billy Graham? Nope. Sometimes people aren't even going to see you coming. You're going to meet them and sit down with a coffee and they're going to leave going, I have never thought of life this way. I got to sit down with somebody a couple weeks ago who had never heard what the Word of God said about life and death and the truth of the, what the gospel is. Grew up in a church their whole life, had never heard the truth of grace. Man. And that person was like, man, I, I just feel like the whole world opened up in front of me. Like I can see what now so many things make sense. This stuff is alive in us, okay? Without Jesus coming into every room, without Jesus knowing us, remember we talked last, night, last week about being known, endeavoring to open every door in this house and let the light of him shine in. That light's going to find things I don't want to have seen. That light is going to find things I don't want to change, things I don't want to stop doing. But if I want life, then I'm going to need that change. Think of movies like Karate Kid. Wax the car, paint the fence. It's just painful. He doesn't want to do that stuff. He wants to learn how to be the karate star. But this guy's teaching him habits that become who you are been saying a lot lately being a christian is not about what you do stop focusing on what you do being a christian is about who you are you are a sinner you are lost without the blood of christ that is who you are you are a purchased redeemed super valuable precious thing in his sight that's who you are i don't care what anyone thinks about you he looks at you and he loves what he made does he rejoice in the mistakes and sin? No. Not any more than I rejoice in my kids trash in the house when I'm gone. But I love them. They're my kids. And if you mess with them, I'm going to mess with you. That's how God is. He sent his son to die for you, to make you what? A redeemed more than a conqueror in this world. He died so that you could overcome things that drag you down. So that you could live for him and be salt and light in this world and be victorious. And be passionate about life and maybe give your life for it. Because this is a breath. The truth is that this life is a breath and nothing here is worth holding on to. Nothing. And the only people you can, only thing you can take with you is people. Take your eyes off the stuff. Start looking at the people. And the one in the mirror first. This is the truth of the word of God. If you want your life to be full of life, then he's got to come in and find the junk and help you get it out so that he can make room for life. Light and darkness cannot exist in the same place. The awesome thing is, light always wins. If I take, some, take a box of dark outside and open it up, it ain't going to be nighttime. God is more powerful than darkness and evil in your life in the same exact way. Open the box. Open the box to your life. So, why did Paul write this letter? He wrote it so that the church in Crete could be strong. They could live and build the foundation of their life on who Jesus is. Were some of them lazy gluttons? Yup. Drunkards doing all kinds of stuff? Yup. All kinds of filth all over the place. Had to look kind of hard to find leaders who were serving the Lord he could put in place. But Paul's desire is for them to live for Christ, to be powerful in the world, and to see souls saved. And he writes this letter saying, you got to identify these things and they have to be purged. So let me give you a little social media end of this because that's real life. Is this scripture calling you to jump down the throat of everybody who puts something ungodly or anti-biblical on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, whatever? No. The Word of God says to speak the truth in love, to be gentle, to come alongside of people, in ways that give them the best chance of listening. But he does say, call it what it is. They're lazy gluttons. Well, they're nice, though. He just doesn't say that. And there will be times when that sounds cold, but the truth is a powerful thing.